Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Keith Maynard and this is the programme where you get to ask your property related questions to our expert panel, who of course are property experts in their own right. So let's see who we have on the panel today. First of all, we have Stefano Lucatello, the senior partner of Cobalt Law. We also have Neil Cobold, COO of Payprop Limited. And last but by no means least, we have Suchith Panous, the CEO of Red Ribbon Asset Management. Thank Gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us. So the questions are going to come thick and fast on today's programme. And I'm going to start first of all with you, Stefano. Nice question this. I bought a small property some 10 years ago for my mother who then found a partner in Spain. He soon moved in with her and has been there ever since. Sadly though, my mother passed away. She didn't leave a will. And whilst I have no intention to ask him to leave, he is seeking probate in his name. This concerns me slightly. And I wonder if he has any rights as someone who has resided in the property for a certain amount of time. And of course, we're looking at Spanish law here, aren't we? Which we are. More than suited to answer. Well, we've got lots of points to look at. Uh, lots of questions, uh, lots of doubts. I'd want to sit the gentleman in front of me and I'd like to ask him lots of questions because he says, I bought. Now, did he buy with his own money and gift the property to his mum? Or does he still own the property? Because if he, the, the, the short answer, Keith, is this, that if he owns the property, he bought it himself, then it won't matter that mum's died and that the gentleman's in, in the property because he can then decide what to do with the gentleman, either enter into a proper Spanish tenancy, which is a four plus four in Spain, out of interest, um, or he can say, well, I want you out if he wants to be mercenary, but he said that he doesn't want to, uh, to let the gentleman go uh, or force him out. So we'd need to investigate. I would think probably that mum gave him, gave son a lump of money at some point and said go out and buy me please a retirement home and that the property was in the name of the deceased and as such if the property was in the name of the deceased and it wasn't transferred there was no share transferred to the other gentleman uh, then he has no real locus standi he has no real uh, position in law to stay there he he can I, I don't know if how he can uh, take Co uh, probate out uh, on whether he's taking probate out in England or whether he's doing this under succession laws in Spain. Uh, the question is too wide to be able to define it clearly and, and we'd need much, some more clarification. But if he is attempting to take out probate uh, in England, uh, it wouldn't be probate, it would be grant of letters of administration because there is no will uh, because the lady died intestate. Uh, as such, he would not be able to benefit because intestacy under English law is governed by the Administration of Estates Act 1925 and there is a clear delineation, a clear list of people of who benefits and how much they benefit to what tune they benefit to. So we need to really clarify that. I would ask the gentleman to possibly write us some more information and perhaps we could come back to it at a second point. Um, there is too much to be able to answer uh, specifically, but as a general guideline, if the gentleman is living there, he doesn't own the property, doesn't have a share in the property, a stake in the property, then he has no position at law to stay there, and it's all dependent on the son to deal with. Okay, well, a very complex question, yeah. which you actually managed to make quite simple in the end, so thank you very much indeed. Much appreciated, Stefano. Thank you. Right, let's move on. Um, Suchith, I have a question here for you now. Uh, my mother and father migrated to the UK about 30 years ago, and they've now passed away. They've left a large eight bedroom house in New Delhi. The paperwork states that myself and my brother inherit the property with a 50-50 share. However, now I want to sell the property, but my brother wants to keep it for another few years and then renovate it. How can I get my half of the share now? Well, I, <clears throat> I think it, apart from the fact that this the property is in India, the, the real uh, crux of the matter here is there's joint ownership on a property and one half of the ownership needs liquidity out of the asset. The only way one could do that is either you sell the property and split it or you ask your brother to buy you out. Um, that, those are the only two options you uh, are, are faced with. But when you do take the money out, uh, one needs to get proper tax advice on what are the implications related to uh, capital gains. So there's a structuring needed to be done to ensure that at the time of liquidity, which could be that the brother pays X amount of cash, uh, to the other brother, then uh, where is that? Where who is paying that? Is a brother a UK uh, resident for tax purposes, or is it in India? So those things are not clear in that question. Mm -hmm. um, again, like as in the previous question, we need more information on that. But prima facie, it's a liquidity event that he's looking for. He wants his share out, uh, either sell the property uh, or ask the brother to buy, buy him out, and then deal with the tax implications after. 
Is, is there a chance, I mean, if he did, in a sense, take his money now, um, tax-wise, is there a chance that he could be charged tax in India and also over in the UK? Does that happen, or is it one or the other? Well, the UK and India does have double tax avoidance treaties in place, so one needs to look into the, those provisions to see where it is, but usually the, 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 the grand principle is you don't get taxed twice. So if you are paying tax in India, then you can offset that in your self-assessment tax return here in the UK. Is it more generous in India or the UK? Uh, it, 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 is, it depends. I mean, there, there isn't an inheritance tax per se, but there is capital gains tax, uh, which in this case is, is, is uh, slightly uh, uh, higher in the case of India uh, than uh, supposed to. So it could go up as high as 35%. Um, so, but then there are structurings possible to ensure that it is shown as an inherited asset from which there's a liquidation. Um, and that again requires local uh, legal advice on the ground in India. Um, again, it also depends on how where the money originates. If his brother is in the UK who's paying him a, a cheque, then that is definitely, as far as the UK taxman is concerned, proceeds of an asset offshore, and the one has got to look at how that would work. Mm. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Sisha. Appreciate that. Neil, another one of your short questions, <laughs> and I do use a slight sense of irony with that. I had originally planned to buy a second property by now, but for several reasons, such as stamp duty changes, prices being so high and banks not lending as much, pretty much accepted that I'm doing well enough by owning one and paying it off as early as I can. I have one property with a tenant. I've recently extended the lease via statutory terms. As I'm a nice landlord, I do not wish to evict my tenant who doesn't want to move and pays the rent as agreed. So how can I sell it on to another landlord? Ideally, keeping fees to a minimum. Local estate agents ask for at least a 1% fee, which is over £2,000. Add to this list of fees and the mortgage redemption penalties, and it would be about £5,000. Well, I think he's asking a few things there. And the first one I want to answer is, is one around the fees. There are always options for you to look at cheap options, but are you basing it on the right decision? If all you're making is decision on price, then that's one decision to make. But he's already taken price out of it because a lot of the places you go to they're looking to sell to people who are looking for the home for their own purposes whereas he's now wanting to sell this in a specialist manner to somebody who is willing to take the property on as an investment with a sitting tenant and because of that they're taking on the previous relationship the indemnities against that tenant and any cause he may have that it's not a standard property transfer so in actual fact the service that he's going to get is he needs to take the professional advice. He needs somebody that has the access to that kind of investor network. And he needs, when he looks at the solicitor side, to make sure that he's covered in the arrangement because it is no longer just the transfer of a property and an asset. Um, it's fine saying you're being nice and not wanting to evict the tenant, but he also goes through that whole process and he gets the income. So it's always an offset because he can actually then pass it along with a, a ready yield, which makes it more attractive when he's going through and looking at somebody to run for a, an investor. I would go and look for somebody who's specific within that market. Do your research, find somebody that you can speak to or get recommendations or can see that they've actually dealt in this selling a property as a yield asset to an investor. You know, I've got lawyers and I've got asset people to my left and right who are used to probably dealing with this on a more regular basis, but they're the kind of people that he needs to be going and getting this advice from because it's a more legal structure that he needs and it's a different market that he's looking to. He can find people out there saying, I'll sell your property for 500 pounds on sites that offer the online or the hybrid, but they're not aiming at the market that he needs this specialist person to come from. So take price out of your question. If you're wanting to be nice, you're selling an asset with a sitting tenant, use that as your guiding principle and then look at what the specialists are able to tell you the best method to go through that. Okay. Good advice. And again, uh, you know, again, quite a complicated scenario mm. from which to weigh through. But thank you very much for, for simplifying it for us. Yeah. Right. It's golden nugget time. And Stefano, I believe you have something you'd like to share with us. Yes, it was something interesting that came out in the uh, beginning of two, end of uh, 2015, beginning of 2016, which is many, many English people in the early 2000s bought properties or attempted to buy properties in Spain. And they were buying new builds off plan and the developers either went into liquidation or disappeared with the monies. But the monies were paid into a bank account that the development company owned. And as such, the new law from the Supreme Court in Spain states that if you 
as a whatever, it doesn't matter what nationality you are, bought through uh, a developer and the developer disappeared or went into bankruptcy and you lost all your money, you can now make a claim directly against the bank. You don't have to go against the developer and seek him out or seek it out if it's a company. You can sue the Spanish bank and you will get your money back as long as you fulfill certain criteria such as the claim is no more than 15 years old and the money can be traced to that bank account irrespective of whether it went to that development company or not. So the best thing is you can now have a choice to sue at the developer if you can find him. If not, go straight for the bank. This is great news. Uh, did this affect a lot of people in the UK? Over 100,000 investors have come forward so far and the amount of money is over £20 billion. Pounds. Wow. Yes. So that's incredible. Yes, so what I'd urge people to do is ring a specialist international lawyer and get your advice because many people think that they've just lost that money and they've not thought about it. But many people are now seeking advice and getting their money back. Great piece of advice there. Thank you very much indeed, Stefano. And thank you so much to each and every one of you. That's all we've got for the first half. Don't go anywhere, though. Lots more coming very soon. back you are watching property question time i'm keith maynard and of course our panelists today are stefano lucatello neil cobold and suchith panus gentlemen we had quite a lively discussion in the first half we're looking to continue that now we're going to crack straight on with a question for you neil <laughs> i always have to giggle to myself when i read your questions because you some, something about people write for you specifically long Weighty questions. Essays. Essays. Six yeah. in ones, we call them. Here we go. My partner's father is gifting her 40k towards a property. I have no deposit to bring to the table, but will be paying a larger proportion of the mortgage and bills going forward. Due to low wage and poor previous history, I've applied and had a sole mortgage accepted. All we want to do is safeguard her 40k in the event that we split. We accept there's a loss, i.e. the mortgage is repaid and 40k remains, that she'll get the, the larger sum and we will share the loss 50-50. If there's a profit, the 40k goes to her and we will share the remaining 50-50. I had hoped a declaration of trust would do it, but as she will not be on the mortgage, I'm told she can't be on the deeds. I'm keen to safeguard her as I would want the same in her position. Are there any other ways? No, I lost myself well, nearly halfway through there. So that's, I that's okay, because actually, although I am quite clear on what needs to be done, I also have somebody from the legal profession inside <laughs> of me that I'm going to turn to to make sure that what I say is correct. Okay. Um, he was nodding. He was nodding furiously throughout <laughs> the questions. Don't worry. Yeah, okay. No, always take advice. It's what we say. Yeah. Um, so there are options there, and the options will come down to the process that we're going through. Um, what actually got me a little bit... Uh, given the two options, is he mentioned that with some low income and poor credit, but has still managed to secure a sole mortgage. And actually, who he's got the mortgage through could influence the decision that he needs to go through. He could go and put a second charge notice actually on the title, the, the land registry itself, to the benefit of his partner for the 40000 And for most mainstream lenders, this is something that they wouldn't generally have a problem with so long as it is registered as a second charge. However, some subprime or less premium lenders do not like second charges going against the property. So in which case he can do what's called a, a C1 charge, which is an unregistered charge. So it wouldn't actually show up, but would actually give more security against the property than a trust deed, which actually has, although it's a relationship between them as two individuals, isn't actually tied to the asset itself. But my first and foremost would be to go and approach, and if you are wanting to get this protected, with the information, approach your mortgage company, go to a solicitor, a legal professional, get their advice, get it structured properly, because he also has some quite clear guidance on how he wants it to be enacted upon certain things. You know, what happens if you were to pass away? What happens then? And these are things that a lawyer would want to structure within that second charge that clearly said upon these things, this is how it is to be handled. I think I'd say, Keith, that an agreement in principle before he goes anywhere with his partner is necessary. Yeah. And the agreement would set out the whole chronology. 
it would have the recital saying this is the history, it would then go into the main part of the agreement saying this is what we want to do, this is what's going to happen, and if any of the following circumstances occur, this is who will benefit to the tune of X, Y, Z. So it's clear. And then they would each sign it, it would be witnessed, it would be a legally enforceable uh, agreement. Regardless of names being on deeds or anything like that, that would still it, it would take be, precedence? Absolutely, absolutely. Excellent. Okay, great advice. Thank you both very much indeed. Right. Um, Stefano, this house, this house, this question is for you. I'm just going to give you a house. Oh, Stephanie. that's very good. Uh, we're hoping to sell our UK house and with the equity buy a house in France and an apartment in the UK, they would all need to go through at the same time so we're not homeless. Um, is it possible to do it this way? Uh, obviously, buying the <coughs> property in France, we're not quite sure how easy it will be. Right. The first thing to say, Keith, is this, that under English law, we have something called common law. French law, like the rest of Europe, is something called civil law. The system in France is that there is a notaire. The notaire is a public servant. He will or she will notarise the documentation and the final signing deed. It's very much easier in England to exchange contracts and arrange then a completion because completion usually takes place 30 days after uh, the exchange of contracts unless there's something else which is a long stop date. So what you need to do is you need to have the French lawyer who is the notaire because you don't have the equivalent of a solicitor usually buying you a property abroad. It's a notaire. You go from an estate agent directly to the public servant who is the notaire and he will do what's called the act authentique, which is the authentic act. So really, you need to make sure that the notaire is not playing golf on the day you want to complete in England because it's quite often the case that they will not be in the office. So you need to say to them, give me a series of dates and then you accord that series of dates with your English transfer and complete the English and the French on the same day. Um, you also need to make sure that you transfer monies uh, across because it will not happen on the same day. My view is, for the sake of, 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 of practicality, that you will sell your English property first, you will put your money into your bank account, and then a few days later or the same day you will transfer the money from England to France to your French bank account, and you will usually need to go into some rented accommodation, I think for a period of, time, period of few days even because it then allows the completed monies to come into your solicitor's account in England. It usually happens on a Friday, so nothing much will go out then. And then the following week, transfer the monies from England to France to your French bank account, and then during that week or the following week, complete the French purchase. So it's not really possible to, to make it completely seamless in the sense so. of moving out of one straight no. into another. No. no. That's a really good point no. to make. OK. So I expect a, a temporary arrangement yes, in the Yes, absolutely. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Right, I am learning a lot, as always, when we do these, uh, these, these question times. Um, Suchit, this, this question now is, is coming to you. And I'm an NRI who has properties. And I'm going to question, first of all, I hope you know what NRI stands non for. Non-resident Indian, which is... Okay, city. great, that's great. There's properties around East Asia. I'm buying my first property in India. Since it's a huge country, where should I be looking for the highest yields? Good question. Um, you know, I think there are two elements to this. One is to um, you know, typically look at the strategy to go into entry points for the real estate market. Now, uh, India broadly is split into um, uh, three tiers of cities. So you have tier one cities, which are the large four metropolis cities, uh, tier two and tier three, which is based on population. Uh, the best yields, best capital growth are in tier three and tier four because they are near enough ground floor opportunities in terms of development. So capital growth on an annualized basis is definitely more in the smaller cities as these are coming together. Um, now, I think the, the macro for, for the, the buyer to look at is the fact that we have about 700 odd million people who are moving from countryside into cities in India. Uh, it's the single largest urbanization in the history of mankind. And this urbanization is going to flow into the tier one, two and three cities. Uh, the the uh, the hassles related to buying in tier three is often the fact that it is further out of transportation points, so you have to fly or change flights in, in terms of management. So if the individual is looking to buy just one property, uh, then I would say it is a no-brainer to go into a tier one city because you can fly there, look at it, and you get um, um, slightly more sophisticated estate agents or uh, letting agents who can manage the property for you. If you're not planning to rent the property but just buy and hold, then that's 
fairly straightforward, um, but there's no such thing as buying a property and locking it and leaving it. You'll always have something coming up, and that's what one needs to learn from property investment and, and sort of the buy-to-let world. Um, but India, over the last 10 years, has been improving in terms of the number of options you have. So large firms like Knight Frank, which is a brand that we would understand here, JLL, CBRE, they're all in there offering various levels of services to manage a property. So if it's one property, go into tier one. If it's a portfolio plan, then go into a few tier two, tier three cities. It all depends on the corpus uh, and what he wants to do over a medium to long term. And, and I suppose if, if, he, if he or she you know, really wanted to do more work and be willing to do that traveling, the greater investment technically would be to go for a tier three or tier four. Indeed, yeah. Even if it's just the one. But there's Correct. going to be more legwork on his or her part. Correct, yes. Okay, yeah. excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Neil, you like to share your golden nuggets with yes. us. Uh, and referencing, I believe, is on the cards today. Yeah, um, it's one of the things we've been talking about a lot. So um, with the recent changes coming through uh, for legislation for estate agents, I know it's one of the things that's been um, under the microscope. And there's also within uh, England, within the private landlords, there has been a move away from them feeling a need to have a reference due to the cost. Um, we're also seeing knock-ons from these potential changes and the fee bill coming in that have caused people to remove themselves from the market. So we've had insurance companies as a whole deciding that actually the whole referencing market is nothing more for them to be involved in. And I think that's sending out the wrong message because the reason that they're removing themselves, we have some private landlords seeing that that it's because it's no longer needed. The reason they remove themselves is because actually technological solutions are going at such a pace that actually the insurance companies are no longer needed to have somebody to do the laborious task. It's not that the reference is not needed. You wouldn't buy a property without getting a survey done on it first, or you wouldn't go and deal with an investment without going and speaking to somebody and making sure your property is looked after. It should be the same with a tenant. Don't allow somebody to sit resident in your asset without going and getting the reference advice on. But if it's coming down to cost, there are a lot of solutions out there which are really reducing the cost of you actually doing that, but having the same protection and cover that are actually being sponsored by the insurance companies out there or looked at by the credit bureaus themselves. Um, I know there's a few solutions which are in the early stages, which are actually going to provide tenants a way to do free referencing and actually approach a landlord almost with a way of saying, look at me, I would like to rent your property. And so that's where I think a landlord needs to come on and see this as I do everything to look at the health of my property and my investment. Let me do the same of the person who's actually going to sit in there and be the person actually looking after that investment for me on a day-to-day -day basis by me in resident. I should check them out as well, not see that referencing is no longer needed. I get it from some landlords that I teach. It's okay. I can spot a good tenant a mile away. It's an emotional decision. We should be taking, as we always say out of the purchase, the emotion from it. This is an asset you're purchasing. Do the same with the person who's going to be sitting in there. Absolutely. Great. So great news, particularly if it moves into free referencing yeah. uh, from a tenant's point of view. But the message there to landlords is do go and get that, that, you know, that referencing done. It's very, very important. Absolutely. I know if I buy from the internet, I always check the company out uh, before, I, before I purchase from them. You know? So it's, it's pretty yeah. much the same thing. Same principle. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, very much indeed for sharing your knowledge and your time with us today. Um, that's it for today's episode of Property Question Time. Don't worry, though, there's plenty more coming. And if you'd like to be one of the contributors and send us in a question, you can do so by contacting us at property-tv.co.uk and, of course, send your questions our way. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you again soon. Thank you.